Hello and welcome to Stories of Scotland Fireside Folk Tales, the delightful wee enchanting interlude episodes. I'm Annie, a lighthouse blinking on a distant island. And I'm Jenny, a fishing boat full of illegal goods. <laughs> and in this wee episode, we are whisking you away to a peaty fireside on the Isle of Mull. And what better accompaniment to some traditional tales than a traditional wee dram? Ah, but is that a traditional whiskey you've got there, Jenny? If by traditional you mean illegal, then yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> Back when we had a high tax on alcohol, a Highland and Island folk were adamant that a good dram should not be costing an arm and a leg. And so they sat about illegally distilling whiskey in secret hiding holes of the glens and moors of Scotland. And the Isle of Mull was no different. We've got two wonderful wee tales inspired by a book called Tall Tales from an Island by Peter McNabb. And they're not only about the most famous of Scottish spirits, but also about good old community spirit and spooky old ghostly spirits. Oh, how thrilling. That's the spirit, Annie. (laughs) But just before we start, Annie, of all the lovely listeners listening right now, How many do you think like learning about the language, heritage, archaeology, literature, landscape, identity, folklore and magic of Scotland's Highlands and Islands? Every single one. Well, do I have a course for all of you lovely listeners? Because the University of the Highlands and Islands Culture and Heritage BA Honours course is an interdisciplinary degree that explores all of these topics and more. This degree is an incredible opportunity to gain a deep understanding of the rich heritage that has built this region. It's offered as an online course and internationally accredited. So, no matter where you are in the world, near or far, land or sea, this course is a path to understanding the beating heart of the Highlands. You can study full-time or part-time and as single or joint honours. Follow the link in the episode description to learn more. So to start us off, my tale is called How They Dodged the King's Men. The King's Men were despised in all the land because the King's Men were tax collectors. For those who distilled whiskey, these men were to be avoided at all costs, literally. For if found distilling illicit whiskey, you would not only have your still confiscated, you'd also be slapped with a heavy fine or even jail time. Yet, across the highlands and islands, folk continued to practice their ancient tradition, distilling their water of life deep in the glens and selling it on the illegal peaty brown market. And the Isle of Mull was no different. Many caves and ruins on Mull still hold the historic imprints of these illegal activities. And it was in one of these caves, in the cliffs below Glac Gugari, that a huge amount of illegal whiskey was distilled. The cunning folk of the area built a big turf wall over the front of the cave to ensure the huge flames were hidden from the prying eyes of the king's men. The copious amounts of grey peat smoke rose high up the cliff face, but it simply blended in with the rocks as if it were never there. And for extra protection... They even diverted a nearby waterfall to trickle down over the mouth of the cave, ensuring complete safety. Under this masterful concealment, the locals were able to produce a huge amount of whiskey. They stored it in big barrels, and once there were enough, these barrels were, in the dead of night, carted to the shore. Here they were loaded onto fishing boats, found sometimes for as far as the shores of Ireland. But in this tale, they are off to sell their illicit wares on the Isle of Tyree. As the sun began to rise, the wee boat was still beating its path over the waves, when to the smugglers' dismay, they saw the king's men on a cutter, a fast-sailing boat, coming right for them. Ah, rotten turnips, they've been spotted! The crew quickly jumped into action and, catching the wind, made straight for the Isles of Col and Tyree in the distance. 
As a little fishing boat laden with illegal barrels barreled close to Tyree, the cutter was gaining on them with each passing minute. Desperate, the men steered their little boat round the jutting headland and entered a bay. As they came around the corner, the sailors were shocked to see a large crowd of islanders, not just watching them, but bellowing and shouting at them. They had been following the chase from the shores. The fishermen sailed towards the crowd, and once they got close enough, the islanders splashed out into the cold waters and started hauling the barrels off the boat. One by one, the whiskey barrels were whisked ashore and hidden as swiftly as the wind. The folk helped the sailors lift their boat from the water and carry it up to where all of the islanders' boats were kept. They slotted it in between two unassuming vessels which were no sooner drenched in water, along with all the other boats, to make identifying the illegal one that much harder. While this was being done, cattle were being driven across the sands, destroying any and all telling signs of activity. It was a wonderful sight to see, as if the island folk had been training their whole lives for this very moment. Soon, the king's cutter rounded the headland, but by this time, there was not a soul on the beach. It was as if there had never been anyone on the island at all. The men on the cutter were bamboozled. There was nowhere the little boat could have sailed without them being able to see it. It had to have gone ashore. And so the king's men sailed into the bay and disembarked splashing ashore in search of the criminals. All the king's men found were two old fellows swapping gossip while mending their fishing nets. You there, did you see a small boat come ashore but five minutes ago? called the head of the king's men. But the two old men knew no English and so just continued fixing their nets quite happily. One of the king's men stepped forward and snatched the net from the islanders, in broken Gaelic, he asked if they had seen a boat come ashore. Astonished, the two old men looked at each other and shrugged. Why, the only boats here are our own, one replied. Take a look over there at them and you'll see that no one has been out on the waters today. The king's men inspected the row of vessels, but had to conclude that none of these boats looked like the one that they were in pursuit of. And scanning the area around them, they saw only the smallest signs of life in the bay. High beyond the shore, a few folk were tilling their fields with some cattle grazing lazily by, but that was all. The criminals must have hugged the shore and sped on, concluded the king's men. Quick, we're wasting time and letting them get away. Back to the cutter, we must catch them. And so the king's men left the island and sailed on, tearing after a boat that didn't exist. But what did exist was a good few barrels of whiskey and a town full of jubilant people. That night, a right good Cayley was had, and the men from Mull were celebrated as heroes. That is truly some community spirit. I know. What an absolute undertaking. And I feel like this isn't just a fairy tale or folklore. I feel like this probably happened. A hundred percent. It's a community grouping together to hide the rebellious spirits, I feel. <laughs> <laughs> and just before your story, Annie, of all the lovely listeners listening right now, how many do you think like learning about the language, heritage, archaeology, literature, landscape, identity, folklore and magic of Scotland's Highlands and Islands? Every single one. Well, do I have a course for all of you lovely listeners. Because the University of the Highlands and Islands Culture and Heritage BA Honours course is an interdisciplinary degree that explores all of these topics and more. This degree is an incredible opportunity to gain a deep understanding of the rich heritage that has built this region. It's offered as an online course and internationally accredited. So no matter where you are in the world, near or far, land or sea, this course is a path to understanding the beating heart of the Highlands. You can study full-time or part-time and as single or joint honours. Follow the link in the episode description to learn more. 
my tale also takes us to the hidden crevices of Mull, where three neighbors, Colin, Craig, and Callum, had quite the illicit operation going. Each night, one of them would go out to the glens to where they had a wee hidden distillery shack, and he would spend all night making whiskey, working the fire and collecting the water of life. Now the second man would keep watch, making sure that they were not going to be caught, and the third final man would make the casks in which they could store their whiskey. Now these three guys were well known across all the islands for their good quality product, and it was in exceptionally high demand, especially around Christmas time and Hogmanay for there's nothing quite like a fiery wee dram to warm you up in the cold, long winter nights. And so, this story takes place on a Hogmanay night, that's New Year's Eve, when the men were returning from delivering a rather large amount of whiskey to Tyree. Those Tyree folk really like their whiskey, eh? Tyree is actually also, it's famous for its grains, so they made a lot of whiskey on Tyree, so I'm shocked that they are looking to import it, but for the sake of this story, they were. And my story. <laughs> <laughs> While the people of Tyree were celebrating the coming of a new year, these three neighbours were rowing their much lightened boat back to Mull. But with each beat of the oars, the waves rose, and soon their wee vessel was being tossed and turned from wave to wave by the merciless sea. To make matters even worse, the gusting winds blew torrents of snow suddenly coming from heavy clouds. This engulfed the men in a roaring blizzard. The men diligently rowed and rowed. They continue onwards, but tragically, after a wee while, Colin succumbed to the freezing sea spray and bitter winds, and he was swept into the ocean and as much as they tried to find him, it was useless in the storm. Distraught at the loss of their friend, and terrified of the same outcome, the two remaining men rowed like never before, using every piece of energy and every muscle in their body, wishing the boat to meet dry land. But it was impossible to see where they were going, Despite this, though, on and on they rode, desperate to run aground to their sweet home, the island of Mull. But alas, they did not find home. And after another hour of these horrendous conditions, the next man, Craig, he was also swept into the sea, his voice drifting on the wind. Callum tried to row towards him to get him back, but he was swallowed by the ocean in no time. And so Callum was alone and scared. He almost gave up. He huddled as small as he could get, cradling himself, and tried to keep the last of his warmth in his body, feeling the candle of his life flickering, determining to have one last attempt at finding Mal. He kept the stern of the wee boat to the wind. Hour after hour of night passed, each one somehow darker than the last and each one colder. Callum was bobbing in and out of consciousness, and then he was roused by the unmistakable noise of waves crashing on rocks. There was land nearby. He steered the boat forwards, towards the sands, praying that his boat wouldn't be smashed upon the rocks and flung out to the sea. As he got closer, he was just about to guide the boat behind a jutting rock, where hopefully there would be somewhere he could land. Yet, to his surprise, he suddenly heard a voice call out from the land ahead of him. Here, come here! But before he had a chance to respond, another voice shouted from his left. No, son, land your boat here, this is the safest point! Came a third voice to his right. Nonsense, this here is the safest place to land. Steer your vessel towards my voice. He was so confused, he had a voice to his left, to his right, and straight ahead, all calling for him, saying to him that safety was in their direction. He was baffled by this clamour and had to muster the last of his strength to call back to them. Who goes there? Name yourselves. 
the voice straight ahead was drowned out by the waves, but the voice to the left said, I am the son of the red-haired fellow. While the voice to the right called, I too am the son of the red-haired fellow. And then from nowhere, a fourth voice called out, I am the son of the fair fellow, and I'm telling you, come this way, land here. Be quiet, the lot of you. Callum roared this at them. He was wet and desperate, so he just had to trust his instinct. Following his gut, he decided to trust the voice that was drowned out by the waves and just continue straight ahead. And so he guided his wee boat to where this first voice had called from. Just as Callum was about to clamber ashore and drag himself to safety, a swelling wave dashed his boat across the rocks. He expected many hands to reach down and pick him up to tell him he was safe, but no grasp came. Instead, the steady darkness swallowed him, and he passed out where he lay on this unfamiliar shore. A few freezing hours later, the sun rose behind stormy clouds. Callum eventually returned to consciousness and pulled himself further inland. When he stood, he was shocked to see that he could see every edge of this tiny rocky outcrop he had landed on. He walked to the highest points, which was covered in weather-beaten grass, but which the water never reached. He called out over and over, but there was no sign of life, let alone the owners of the four voices he had heard the night before. Equally perplexed and weary, Callum used his knife to dig a shallow hole atop the rocky outcrop. He piled stones around him in a wee makeshift cairn to protect himself from the elements, and he hunkered down to ride out the storm. That night... He was awoken by calls from the darkness, shrieks and cries echoing all around him as he lay there. Terrified, he did not leave his makeshift burrow, but instead told himself that it must be his own imagination playing tricks with the wind. It must be the seabirds calling out to each other in the darkness, though the call was sounded so human like ancient voices that echoed across the island and into his very soul. The next day, the weather cleared enough for him to look out across the choppy sea and see that there was land far, far away. He could see the snow-capped mountains of distant isles, but he was so far away from them that he couldn't identify these hills at all, and so he didn't know where he was. All that he really knew was that he was completely lost, and despite the nighttime howling sounds, he was utterly alone. In the clear weather, he could see the smashed planks of his boat gently bobbing near where he had landed. His gut instinct had been right in following that first voice that had called to him, but he had not heard it since. And now his boat was smashed, he had no means of escape. Suddenly feeling a pang of hunger, Callum remembered that he had a wee slab of butter wrapped in a cloth in his pocket. Ah yes, I never go anywhere without my handy pocket butter. (laughs) And you'll be thankful for your pocket butter when you are next shipwrecked, Jenny. (laughs) Precisely. (laughs) And so was Callum. He thought, yes, my pocket butter, yummy. (laughs) He was able to pop some limpets from a rock and warm them in the sun and cover them in his pocket butter, making not an incredible but a bearable meal. The dark night followed, and again he heard the roaring cries of the many voices. Some sounded as though they were calling for help, as if they could be drowning in the sea. Others were shouting warnings out to the ocean perhaps speaking to invisible ghost ships he could not see, and yet more were advising imaginary ships on where to land in the darkness. But no one joined Callum on his island. He knew in the night to never leave his hidey hole in search of who was speaking. 
Callum knew he was alone on the island, and whatever the voices may be, they were not to be trusted. They were something supernatural. The howling came and went every night, and sometimes Callum was tempted to try to negotiate with them, but he always held himself back. Instead, he pictured his wife and bairns back home in Mal beside their fireplace, and he pledged to return to them. And so the days folded into weeks and soon months had passed, with Callum barely scraping a survival, his pocket butter long gone. He was alive nonetheless, and it was the thought of his family that kept him going. This was until St. Peter's Day, that is, the 29th of June. Oh, wow. He's been out here since New Year's Eve. So that's six months on this little island. It was a painfully long time indeed. He looked back on the days when he still had his pocket butter and he thought fondly of them. Those slippery, slippery days. (laughs) But then on St. Peter's Day, the sea was unusually calm. A small fishing boat was exploring the water and there they saw on a distant island... Callum, waving frantically, jumping and shouting out for help. They soon rescued him and took him over to Eust. Here he regained his strength and he told the locals of his harrowing experience and what he had heard every night. As time passed, the voices of the island became less real and more dreamlike in his memory. So, by the time he was well enough to head home to Mull, he wasn't sure if a single one had been real. Were they the voices of those drowned at sea in horrific accidents? Were they seabirds calling out to their young? Was it Craig and Colin looking out for him from their watery graves? Callum was too scared to ask the folk of Eurist of the history of the rock he had been stranded on. And so... When he eventually got home to Mull and was reunited with his wife and bairns, he decided to never speak of the voices. There was a huge celebration upon Callum's return. His wife had convinced herself he was lost at sea like his comrades, and she had just had to sell all of his belongings so that she could support their young family. But when Callum returned, all of the locals brought back his possessions, and they did not ask for their money to be returned. They were just delighted at this miracle of survival. Sadly, with tears in his eyes, Callum explained to Colin and Craig's families what had become of them. The island mourned these two men, and they gave them proper funeral ceremonies, and their voices were never heard in the waves again. But still, though Callum did go back to distilling whiskey, he never set out on his boat again. And he stayed where it was safe, on the island of Mull. Wow, what a tale! Yes, so the small rock that Callum washed up on is called Hoysker, which lies about 30 miles north of Mull, which just shows how far he was meant to have drifted in this fierce winter storm. Oh, and what do you think, Annie? Were they ghostly voices of lost souls whose end had come in the cold waters around this rocky islet? Were there spirits washing up on the shore each night? I mean, Jenny, I feel like in your heart it's certainly possible because many ships were lost in the waters where this outcrop lies. It sits at the southern end of the Minch, which is notoriously difficult to navigate in adverse weather conditions. But... You don't need to worry, Jenny, because the island has a lighthouse now. That's really great. And one day, Annie, I will get you to admit that secretly you think ghosts are real as well. (laughs) 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 It was the last thing I do. (laughs) One day, Jenny, but not for now. Thank you all so much for listening to Fireside Booklore. Until next time, Slangeva. Slangeva. (laughs) 